Wow, that's it's, a it's really a big, good fish. It's a really big one. You want to grab him? Yeah. This week on Kentucky Afield. Uh-oh. There's one. There we go. Yep. A jerkbait bite can be one of the most exciting. And a great time of year to try it is now. There you go. <laughs> Next. Spring is here, and that can mean a lot of things, one of which is that bears are on the move. Find out what you need to do to stay bear aware. Then, we'll take a look at one way that you can help improve your turkey populations for the future. It's all next on Kentucky Afield. It's a pretty fish. Beautiful. This pond is plum loaded with frogs. They're everywhere in here. Yeah, this is a good fish right here. Really good fish. Come here, girl. Hey, boy. That's a big rabbit. Nice job. Yes! Yes! <laughs> My first musket. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Kentucky Field. I'm your host, Chad Miles. Join us as we journey the Commonwealth in search of outdoor adventure. Hey, when the water temperatures start to warm in the spring, there may not be a more effective technique for catching largemouth bass than a jerkbait. So today we're out here with Bradley Roy on Cedar Creek Lake, right here in Central Kentucky. Hey, you don't live far from this lake, and uh, this is a lake that for you, you say you like to use for a, kind of a prep preparatory lake. Absolutely, you know, it's full of big fish, which you know, we all know that, it's a great place to fish, but it's got a lot to offer. You know, we got a little bit of riprap shoreline, we got some offshore cover, we got timber, there's grass in this place, so you really can fish what you want to fish. And if I'm going somewhere in the country where it's got grass, I'll come down here and fish the grass a little bit. So it's really a neat place. Even though it's a small lake, it's got a lot to offer. Today is really to go out, kind of like what you do for a living, figure out a pattern and hopefully put some fish in the boat. Absolutely, figure it out as we go. It's March, these fish are as fat as they're going to be all year, but you got a chance to catch you know, maybe the biggest fish of your life. So that's why we're here. Cedar Creek's a great place to, it's a great place to fish because even if you're not getting a lot of bites, you know, your opportunity to catch a good one, you know, say you only catch five, your odds of getting one of those to be a really good fish is, is pretty high. Uh-oh, there's one. There we go. Yep. I saw that thing hit. Feels like a good one too. There you go. Cedar hey, Creek's special. That's exactly right. Why you come here right there. Look at that. That's a, that's a good one. Look at the head on that fish, the mouth. He really got it too. I was worried they might not like that color, but maybe I'll throw that color a little I'll more. I'll tell you what, I, I just made my third cast with a color that ain't too far off from that. I wasn't <laughs> sure what you were throwing, so I'm glad they like it. <laughs> In this lake, it's one fish over 20 inches, and that fish is gonna be right at it. This fish is gonna be real close. I'm gonna fish at least 19. That's what I call Cedar Creek special. You know, just a four pound class fish, places full of them. Anytime you come down here and you figure out how to get a few bites, you're usually gonna catch a handful of these yeah. right here. Yeah. Uh-oh, here we go. I believe this one's of the smaller variety, but it's a bite. Yeah, it is a fish. It sure is. They gotta start somewhere, don't they? Hey. You gotta have all age classes and... I'll take anything I can get. Shoot, yeah. And it's just there cold. There you go. He'll grow up. A little large mouth. And this is really perfect conditions for a jerk bait. You got, you got pretty high sun so they can see it. They can get a good contrast when they're looking up at that bait. Because we're definitely throwing this over top of their heads. Oh yeah. And then you got the, the wind which is refracting on the, on the top of the water. And it's just a good, it breaks up that sunlight. There's one. Yeah, that's a pretty good fish. A little better fish, yeah. There you go. You got a little moss on there and he still ate it up. <laughs> Said, I'll take that. Yeah. Like you say, it's a free easy meal. She's got a little fish are so cold. You see how white they are? They're yeah. just starting to swim in there. He's just coming up here trying to find him something to eat <laughs> and uh, get ready to spawn. So much fun. 
a lot of the professional fishermen, they all have their different techniques that they're kind of known for. What's your favorite technique? If you had a if you had a way to catch them, somebody said you get to pick your way, what would it be? If I could pick a way, it would definitely be you know pitching and flipping. Yeah. Okay. I kind of pride myself on being versatile. Yeah. Now a jig would be one that you could get hard headed with and probably catch fish anywhere. But if I want to do well on several different places, I've got to be able to throw you know a lot of different stuff. Here we go. Yep, that's a good one too. Just come, just come off of that uh, road bottom there. Oh, it's oh, yeah, that's a good fish. There we go. That is really shallow in there, and I was hitting the bottom, and it was sticking and bouncing, and I pulled it up, and that fish was laying down there, super shallow, on that uh, road bed. Very similar in your fish, not quite as heavy, but big, big mouth. Probably right about 19 inches long or so, if I had to guess. That's what we come here for. Yep, that's exactly right. There's a couple different reasons I do it on a spinning rod. Number one, back when I started throwing a jerk bait, I just threw it on a spinning rod. Mm -hmm. I just got comfortable with it. And then as I grew older and started throwing them on a bait caster and a spinning rod, I actually liked having both because you know your arm gets tired once yeah. you go to the other side. You got a fish on? Yeah, he's got me hung up in that tree. Swim out of there. That looks like the like the other ones. It's maybe a little bigger. Come here. Yeah. That's maybe a little better. Jerk bait again. I think we made a good call coming to the clear water. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. And the interesting thing is, is that we can almost see where we started out. It was just in some of these creek channels, you can get in and all of a sudden you can see a dramatic dr change in the water color. And we just got outside in the clearer water and lo and behold, we're starting to get bites. Oh, no. You're catching good fish, man. Oh, there we go. That is a good fish, isn't it? He hit that right at the boat almost. Looks like a big fish. He wanted to get under the boat, didn't he? Come here, buddy. We got to look at you. There you go. We'll take it. That thing, uh, I don't know what depth we're setting in, but he would come up from about that deep. Setting at 14. You know, if we were fishing a lake that had a 15-inch size limit, like many of them do, we'd be, we'd be setting, I don't know, 15, 16 pounds or so. At least. You know, and because it is a small lake, and we're talking about 800 acres, so it's not like it's a, it's a really, really big lake. It's a great place to come if you've got an afternoon. Absolutely. You don't want to come out here and burn $100 in fuel to go find them. It's, it's a really good opportunity to get out and fish an afternoon or go fish a morning and try to catch a couple fish. Looks there like he I is. said, yeah. Feels like a good one, too. There he comes. Wow, that's Dude, it's, a it's really a big, good yeah, fish. It's a really big one. You want to grab him? Yeah. Yeah. A pair of big girls. There you go. <laughs> Look at that. Hey, we talked about the possibility of catching a six or seven pounder. That's what we did. And you know what? On a spinning reel, you finesse that thing up here, and sure enough, you just, got him. I told you, I had it paused. Felt just like a jig bite. And then they got that jerk bait across the mouth. That is a good fish, my friend. You got a scale in here? I do. And look, I want you to look how pretty guess. that fish is. I'm gonna guess that fish weighs. What do you think? I'm gonna say six. I'm gonna say six. Something, yeah. <laughs> yep, six oh eight. That's what she weighs. When's the best time to fish th throw a jerk bait? We're talking March and April, or in the fall. Absolutely. You know, anytime. It, it, I think once that water temperature bottoms out, we get it as cold as we're gonna get it, and you first start to see it start coming up. That's when these big fish start looking up, and they're, they're looking for that slow, lethargic shad that they can get an easy meal. They're just trying to get ready for that spawn coming in a month or so. And she was waiting on that jerk bait. Nice, nice job. So I'm here today with Sergeant Robinson. You know, the coronavirus has changed a lot of things, but for you guys, you're still out there patrolling and seasons are still on as planned. Yeah, absolutely. All the Kentucky regulations, all the Kentucky statutes, as far as fish and wildlife laws are concerned, they're all still active and we're all still out there, still enforcing them. But the distance that we're keeping, that, that is one thing you're doing a little bit different, is that uh, you're not coming right up and engaging people like you would normally, right? No, absolutely not. It, as far as a, a fishing license check is concerned, there's we can do everything that we need to do from that six to 10 foot distance. Okay. And you wearing gloves, obviously? Absolutely. We're wearing gloves. We have our mask available. So as far as checking your fishing license, I happen to have a fishing license right here. Sure. 
You're looking for the number on there, which means it's uh, a 2020 license? Absolutely. Yeah, we can definitely see that from a six to 10 foot distance. Okay, and as you can tell that that is very visible. What other, what other things are you doing a little different with coronavirus? Uh, checking the, the creel, the size and creel. We can ask you know, the people that we're checking to hold up those fish and we can see if the size and creel is within the regulations. And if not, if we have a question about a fish, they can set the fish down, step to the side and we can approach the fish and measure and count if we need to do so. So really it's using common sense. If a person, if an Absolutely. officer comes up to you in the field or on the boat, you, you're not gonna run up there and immediately start shaking hands. Everybody's keeping their social distance sure. and you guys are doing the exact same thing in the field. Absolutely, it's happened a few times. Don't feel disrespected if you come to, to shake our hands or to get close to us and we ask you to step back. It's for our safety and it's for your safety as well. Absolutely, well hey, hope everyone has a great spring fishing and turkey season right around the corner. Absolutely. If you live in bear country here in the state of Kentucky, this is the time of year you need to be especially bear aware. John Hast, Bear Program Coordinator here for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about what all that entails. Uh, what that entails, a lot of times, uh, this point in the season, it's dealing with a lot of nuisance issues that our bears uh, that our bears cause. I don't know if the range is actually growing so much, but uh, you're, we're seeing them male bears at certain times of mm -hmm. year throughout parts of the state. About this time of the year, the young males start getting more or less bounced out of the the core of the bear range. When the older males come back in to breed, they'll bounce the yearling males out. And that's normally what we're seeing. When we get a bear that, that is up around central Kentucky, that's, it's 99% of the time a, a one-year-old male bear that's just looking for, mm -hmm. looking for food and looking to get out of the core of the bear range. Today we're kind of really focusing on bear aware. Mm -hmm. Definitely about, because we are getting the bears back into Kentucky, so we have to be bear aware in bear country. Mm -hmm. And so we set up a whole campsite as if you're visiting bear country and camping. And also we have like, if you're living in bear country, your backyard. So it's kind of to show what's good and what's not good to, to have out there. Black bear encounters in the state of Kentucky with humans is common, but we've never had a fatality, correct? Correct, yeah. But, but they are, they, they tend to be unpredictable at times. And a lot of that also comes back to, the, to uh, a bear that's is fine with approaching people. You might think that you can, you know, have it approach you or you approach it to get some photos or something like that. And that's always a bad idea. Well, the, the main thing we encounter is uh, bears getting in people's trash and pet food and around the houses is most of the nuisance problems we have. The main thing with a bear is a food source. If there's no food source, then you're not going to see a bear around your house. You'd be buying those plastic garbage cans every night if you have a bear coming by. They'd get pretty expensive. Oh yes, yes. And you can see how quickly he put his head in, got the food out. Even flattened it, so. No. Uh -oh. It's a repeat occurrence until people learn to live with the bears. The whole idea may seem pretty enticing to see a bear, but yep. man, it can really cause some problems, huh? Right. They're and fun. be dangerous. Yeah, they're fun the first day or two, but then once they get that food reward, it's hard to get them to leave. Yeah, look at that. Pretty simple. Yes. I thought it would take a little bit of time for him to get in that cooler, but uh, it no. flipped that thing over and was right in. Yeah, it's a very, it's a cheap cooler from Walmart that everyone has, and yeah, it was, very easy for him to get into. Yeah, the worst case scenario is uh, a bear that's been hand fed, a bear that associates a human with their garbage. And a lot of times we'll see those bears um, around tourist areas, state parks and such that end up being hand fed and become a problem. Um, and they'll approach people, they'll, we've had cases of people being run off their picnic table while the, while the lunch is spread out. And there's really nothing we can do as bear managers except catch and euthanize that bear. And it's, a, it's an unfortunate way for a bear to go, but it's due to their association with humans and food. If you call and say, the bear has gotten in my trash five nights in a row, what's that tell you you need to do? You need to uh, remove that food source. There's several ways to deal with the trash. Uh, leave, leave it inside until trash day and then put it out that morning. Uh, maybe purchase a bear-proof can. So John, what we have here is a, considered a bear-proof container. It is, yeah. So 
we talk about bears being smart. So a bear comes to here a couple times and gets nothing out of it. He's probably going to quit visiting it, or at least he's not going to be strewing the garbage around, correct? Yeah, it's not worth his while to come and get it. And this is very typical of what you'll find in, say, Red River Gorge, throughout the Daniel Boone National Forest. And then a lot of our state parks in bear country have gone to this type of dumpster. So this is just one example. There are other examples of uh, bear-proof con uh, garbage containers, correct? Yeah, there are. Um, these are available in larger sizes for commercial places, uh, gas stations, restaurants, stuff like that. And we encourage our, uh, our uh, store owners in Eastern Kentucky, if they have a bear problem, to think about getting a commercial dumpster. So obviously, if you're a homeowner, this may be a little bit more expensive, but there are other options you can come up with as well. And it can become illegal feed, feeding yeah. bears in, uh, in and around your house, correct? It is. The, the law states that you cannot directly or indirectly feed a bear. Mm -hmm. And what that means is, of course, directly feeding is you intentionally feed. Mm -hmm. Indirect means that, say a bear is getting in your trash or your pet food, mm -hmm. and you keep just keep putting it out, mm -hmm. and you don't try to take measures to keep the bear from getting in it or um, you didn't mean to put the pet food out for the bear but if it gets in it and you keep doing that then that's kind of an, an indirect feeding. It ends up being a uh, little bit of a lifestyle change for the residents that live in the counties that have bears and that that area now is pretty much the majority of eastern Kentucky. When you get east and, and southeast of Lexington you're in bear country and it's best just to be aware take care of your garbage, don't give the bear reason to come around. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you'll still see a bear, but it won't become a problem. Mm -hmm. So we gotta, we gotta be concerned with pet food, mm -hmm. garbage, human food. Human food, bird feeders. Bird feeders. Mm -hmm. And then any kind of, if you've got um, goats and livestock, a lot of people have small hobby farms and those tend to be problems too with chicken feed and, and goat feed. Well, we hope everyone's safe. We want the bears to remain safe and uh, we want people outdoors enjoying, enjoying what we have to offer in the state of Kentucky and Eastern, and Eastern Kentucky especially. But we want people to handle their garbage and, and to do it res responsibly. Yes. So get outdoors and enjoy yourselves, but just take care of your trash and your food, right? That's, that's the main message, Yeah, it's the best way to live in bear country. So if you want to get up and close and personal with a bear, this is a pretty good place to do it at Slato Center, right? I mean, you're typically going to be, you know, you, you're never going to be further than a couple hundred feet, but you're, a lot of times you're going to be within 10, 12, 15 feet, right? Oh, yes, yes. Definitely with the enrichments, he knows. He comes up, he's right there in front of the window, usually just a couple feet from the window to where you can get a good, safe look at the bears. Yeah, a lot better than getting that close out, out in the wild, obviously. We don't want to do that. Yes. If you own a piece of property that you like to turkey hunt on, controlling those nest raiders should be part of your management plan. So we've got three dogs tonight. The first dog we'll hunt is Remy here. She's my oldest dog. She's seven years old, will be eight this summer. I uh, got her from Alabama, uh, raised her from a puppy. And then these two are brother and sister in here, and they're about to be eight months old. Oh, wow got them from Indiana, so we've been training them. So is that something you like doing? You like starting them from yeah. really young? I have raised somewhere near to five to six dogs from puppies. We actually lost a dog recently. I've got a picture of her right here. Her name was Pig, and we won a lot of competition hunts with her. So she's missed, but hopefully she's here with us tonight. I'd say what, for people who own and run dogs, you spend so much time with these dogs, they kind of become a part of you, don't they? Oh yeah, they sure do. Coon hunting's a family kind of thing, and having these dogs, I couldn't do it without my brothers and my mom and dad, and especially my wife, who really helps take care of them. It's, it's not something that uh, you can just forget about during the summertime and pick it back up when hunting season comes. It's 365 days a year. As excited as you get to get out here and do this, they're more excited. They're way more excited. They would go every night if we could. <laughs> One of the biggest safety things for coon hunting is making sure you have a collar on your dog that has your name and an updated number on it. All right, so we can take her down here just a little bit past the truck and hopefully get a coon treat. She's treed down there, that's her tree bark. You can hear, she's, every breath she's barking. How far away we got now? Well, she's not very far, she's about- Less than 100 yards, isn't Yeah, it? she's about 79 yards in there. All right. I think she thinks she found one, so we can head that way. All right. You said you've had nights out here where you've treated many of 10 coons in a night, huh? Yeah, and we've come out here and went home empty-handed, so we'll see what happens here. 
<laughs> Let's hunt. We'll shine the tree now and see if we can't find him. Chad, yeah, it looks like there's a hole at the top where it branches off up there. Den tree, huh? Yeah. Can't really do anything when there's a hole in the tree. Yeah. We're gonna pull her off there and you're gonna send yeah, her back we'll, out. We'll huh? send her back out. We've got plenty of property to hunt. We will go and try again. All right. Hey, that's part of it, isn't it? That is part of it. Good luck, girl. We're all counting on you. <laughs> Remy is so excited about this tree, she's actually chewing on it. <laughs> we can try and squall and see if we can't get him to look. Well, I'm not seeing him in this one either. We'll pull her off and go back out to the road. We'll go to where I proposed to my wife. That should be a good luck place, because she said yes. <laughs> there you go. That's got to be a good spot. So the Garmin says she's treed, shows her the direction she's in, uh, at about 79 yards. Nice and close, let's go see what she's got this time. Get him, Remy. There's your set right there. That's a big raccoon. You wanna shoot him? Why don't you shoot it? You have a good angle over there? Yeah, I can see him right in my light right here. All right. I'm gonna shoot. He's hanging on, I'm gonna shoot him one more time. There it goes. There you go, nice job. I don't hear Remy squalling, so I think you'll No, I think shake. he came out dead. I think that first shot really killed him. He just got kind of hung up in that tree. A veteran dog knows how to fight a raccoon. They'll go for the neck, but a young puppy just getting learning, they'll bite the back end and kind of drag him around. Okay. Remy dead. Well, the dog did a great job. We were able to get in here, locate it, and you put a good shot on it. You're on a piece of property where the landowner knows there are a lot of raccoons here. He's a turkey hunter. We'd like to see a couple of them removed. What we're wanting to do is to eradicate coons to increase our turkey population because they're destroying our nests and stuff right now. So that's what we like to, you know, to get them out of there. They are major nest raiders. Yes. Everything has its place, but everything has to be kind of kept in balance and not a whole lot of predators for raccoons. So every now and then it's good to kind of keep them in check and that helps your turkey eggs so that you have a good healthy flock. Exactly. Well, I always say at the end of every show, I always ask permission to thank the landowner. So thank you for letting us come out here today. Yes, sir, no problem. Now let's check in and see who else has been out having fun in this week's Ones That Didn't Get Away. Here we have Eli Riley with his first deer ever taken in Clark County. It says that Eli loves to watch Kentucky Field. Well, thank you, buddy. Here we have 10-year-old Abby Bronner who took this deer, her very first one, from Spencer County. Nice job. Here we have a really nice buck taken by Christopher King from Robertson County on the family farm. Nice job. Check out this nice buck taken by Matt Smith in Madison County. This here was a 10-pointer. Nice deer. Check out this buck. It has antlers going everywhere. It's a 14-pointer taken by Brandon Smith in Jessamine County. Congratulations. Here we have Anita Albright with a very nice buck taken from Pulaski County. Congratulations. Dawson Gray of Owensboro took this nice 12-point buck while hunting in Washington County. Congratulations. Here's a nice bass caught by Phil Azar from Paducah, Kentucky. This fish was caught out of a local farm pond. Nice job. 
Here we have six-year-old Luke Allen who took his very first deer from the family farm in Broadhead, Kentucky. Nice job. Here we have Noah Flint who took his very first deer using his grandfather's 3030. This deer was taken in Scott County. Congratulations. The turkeys are already starting to gobble and the season comes in on April the 18th. Make plans now to go hunting. And remember, hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission and thank the landowner. Until next week, I'm your host, Chad Miles, and I hope to see you in the woods or on the water.